I love all the sounds of your birds, Leanne. I know. <laughs> Try there if I can hear any Orioles. <laughs> all right. I believe that we are in good shape here and live now. I love all the sounds of your birds, Leanne. Oh, I hear myself. I so, yep. <laughs> Try there if I can hear any Orioles. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. We are definitely live now. And doo -doo 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 -doo. okay. Been live for a moment. <laughs> Hi, this is Jennifer White with Portage Park District. I'll let Cassie and Leanne give a little wave and a hello before we get started. Hello. I'm Leanne, volunteer. <laughs> I'm Cassie, I'm the park director for Brimfield Township. Awesome, thanks you guys for joining me again on the birding report. So we got a lot of feedback after last week's um, birding report about how much you all enjoyed hearing the different, some of the different sounds of the birds and uh, learning some ID tips. And so we're going to do something similar today. Each of us are gonna highlight two different birds. So if you have a piece of paper at home and you wanna number it one through six, for those of you who are practicing your bird calls or um, who you know, already are good at them, then you can just reinforce and test yourself on that because I'll play each one of those individually that one through six. Um, and then we're just going to go through and each of us, uh, you'll see the picture. We'll talk a little bit about that, uh, those birds. And then we're going to close today um, with Cassie's going to share some tips and information on how to attract birds to your yard or to your feeders. And, uh, and of course, Cassie and Leanne, if there's anything in particular that you've seen that's been super awesome, be sure to um, mention that at the end. Um, so just enjoy everybody. So we'll start off here with um, our first one. So number one on your list is gonna be this little guy. All right. Okay, that's number one. And the number two on your list. Number two on your list is this guy. Oh, just had him. Okay. All right, number two on your list. All right. And number three on your list. I love this one. Okay. Ooh, somebody's answering us. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I love it. Oh, okay. And let's see, number four on your list. All right. And number five. Here's number five. All right, and last but certainly not least, number six. Ice cream truck. Sorry. 
And the ice cream truck is number seven. <laughs> you get extra bonus points if you can identify the ice cream truck <laughs> in the background. I love it. I thought we're in a pandemic. What's he doing here? <laughs> So we are going to start here with the with number with number one. Number one on our list is this happy little bird. This should be one that's recognized by most everybody, I would imagine. This is the northern cardinal. The northern cardinal is our state bird for the state of Ohio. And you're looking at the female in uh, the main part of the screen here. And then up in the top right, you'll see the, um, the male. Um, the both of them have that bright orange beak. And look how big and significant it is. Um, and of course, they have the little crest. They're one of our few birds that, um, that do. So they're really easy to uh, identify. The females do have some red on them, but they're usually more of this brown color. And if you listen to the cardinals, they have a few different calls. So I'm gonna play this, this one so you can hear their common songs. Can you guys hear that okay? It was pretty quiet for me. Yeah, a little quiet. Yeah. So we shall go back to the app here. There is more than one way to handle this. The other sound. <laughs> And I'm sure many of you who are listening, if you didn't, weren't aware that that was a Northern Cardinal, then you were like, now you're thinking, gosh, I hear that all the time because they are super active this time of year. Um, they're doing a lot of calling. They also have a, um, a sound that they'll make. That's their song, but a call that they'll make that is um, like a really high pitched, almost like a metallic chirp um, when they're, and they do that often when there's predators around the nest or when there's an invader into their territory. Uh, so you, you'll hear them barking. Um, I think it sounds like a high, like a metallic bark. And uh, it also is really similar to if you ever hear chipmunks um, barking in the woods. I, I feel like the, the Northern Cardinal, when they're uh, making that call, it sounds a lot like that too. So that's your number one is the, the Northern Cardinal. And you, we will see those around year round. Um, the next one, our number two though, is one that we are not gonna see year round, but they have just come into the area um, here over the course of the last week or two. And this is one of my favorites. Um, this is the gray catbird and uh, they are aptly named because the catbird has, if you remember from that call, I'll pull it back up here, that catbird has a very um, cat-like or kitten-like uh, sound that it makes. And they also though, I'll do that call first. They do kind of like a little ratchet. So when you hear that little meow, um, and it sounds like a little kitten lost in the woods, there's a good good chance that it's a uh, is a gray catbird. The gray catbirds uh, tend to uh, nest and be around some scrub shrub areas. They're a great edge bird. Uh, they like thickets and kind of some dense brush, and they are a very charismatic bird. So uh, you they will they will come and be curious and check you out. And they are also part of the mockingbird family. So you will hear them um, do a series. They'll do a fun series of um, calls and mimics from other birds, sometimes even, even sounds of like cars or other animals. And unlike some of our other mockingbird um, family members in Ohio, like the mockingbird will repeat their sounds like three, sometimes more than three times. And the brown thrasher will repeat the sounds or calls twice. The uh, gray catbird, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to theirs. Uh, they just are saying a bunch of things all over the place. So a really fun little bird. You'll notice uh, from this picture, they have a really short 
wing in proportion to the rest of their body and a really long, a longer tail. And those short wings let them whoo, whoo, move through the, the brush uh, real easily. So they're just a fun bird to watch. That's our gray cat bird. All right, Leanne, you wanna talk about our number three, the Baltimore Oriole? Okay. So this is a very, very striking bird. I, um, I found uh, over the last two years, I've been able to attract them to the yard and I was really excited because this year they seem to have told their friends. So we have many uh, feeder or, or Orioles coming to the uh, feeder and they love the, the grape jelly. I go through maybe about a third to a half a cup of grape jelly a day um, from the birds eating it, uh, which is really exciting. And also cat birds are coming to the Oriole feeder, which is oh. cute, eating the, the grape jelly. I, I, they do like fruit as well. Uh, but the Baltimore, um, so the, the calls are somewhat similar between the Baltimore um, uh, and the other uh, Orioles. Uh, but the Baltimore has a flute-like song, uh, so it's so if you hear something that sounds fluty in the distance, it, chances are it could be a, um, a Baltimore Oriole. Um, they also do like a series of a descending whistle call too, like a choo, choo. Um, not quite that, but uh, it's they're they're a bright orange bird with a black hood. Um, the wings are black, uh, the back wings are black, and they have the orange shoulder patches. Uh, strongly white feathers uh, that appear as a um, as a bar basically but they're um, they eat uh, insects as well so they're going to be they'll sit on a perch and then um, sally over to, to gather insects and then go back to their perch uh, but they're just a really cool bird to watch the the males and the females um, young males uh, and young females will look different from the adults so you, there could actually be four different morphs of when you're seeing the same bird, which is also very confusing sometimes, but um, they also make a, a nest, a hanging nest uh, that is, um, they make it out of grasses and things like that, but it hangs down and uh, I've, I've never seen one actually um, in person, but they're, uh, I've read about that. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's the Baltimore Oreo. If you see one, you're going to know it just because they're so striking. Um, and they, they tend to leave earlier in the summer, um, like maybe July, August are going to be gone, which is um, like, oh, summer's almost over. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, so that's Baltimore Oreo. Leanne, I have a quick question about the Oriole. So I have been hearing from other um, birders in Northeast Ohio that there's a lot of people been observing a lot more at their feeders than usual. And I was wondering if you've experienced the same thing or if you just think because more people are home, they're seeing more at the feeders. You know, I don't know, because we actually my husband are commenting, we've actually seen a lot more birds this year. Um, you know, partly I'm sure we're home more, but also, yeah, I, the Orioles, I've never seen so many Orioles in my life. It's crazy. I, like I said, I'm going through, through, through so much grape jelly each day. And it's just like, wow. But yeah, I don't know. Very cool. <laughs> Weird. All right. So let's move on to its friend here. The Orchard Oriole. Hey. So Number this four. is a a uh, similar looking bird, um, although they have some, uh, you know, obviously some differences there, um, but it's a smaller oriole. Uh, it favors the edges of uh, low woods and suburbs, uh, stands in trees and open country, uh, similar to the, the Baltimore. Um, they have a rich, varied whistled note. So when I was reading the um, uh, mnemonics of what they Paw or what they're saying, they look here, what cheer we oh, what cheer whoop you, what you what what we're um, and then the dry chattering cha 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 cha. So I think there's more of a chattering in their call uh, than the flute like call of the, the Baltimore. I'm, I'm sure it would be difficult though initially to, to determine which is which. <laughs> um, again, they migrate south in July, like they're um, like they're. Um, the, the Baltimore is there. Uh, they have a black head, uh, back and tail with a chestnut orange shoulder. Uh, it's the male. Uh, it's chestnut orange shoulder patches, underparts and rump. Uh, the female is kind of an olive green underpart with yellow underparts and two white wing bars, as many birds have as we discussed last week. <laughs> um, they also eat insects and fruit and they'll sally from a branch to, uh, to, get, the, uh, to get the insects. So they're just, and I also saw them, um, I saw one, a male for sure on my, on the Oriole feeder one day uh, as well. So they're, the orchards are around too. So it's just really, they're just so pretty. 
They are. In fact, um, if you don't mind, I'll play and play that one as a reminder yeah. for that call. You can so hear that chattering you were talking about. Yeah, there's a few more chucks in there than mm -hmm. the uh, Oriole seems to have more of a clear flute-like call. The Baltimore. Very cool. Gosh, it's so nice. <laughs> All right. I love that we have ice cream truck background music. <laughs> so good. All right. How about our number five? Yeah. Number five. So um, this is the ruby-throated hummingbird. And I always say if you're be a beginning birder, a great place to start is hummingbirds mm -hmm. because there's only really one hummingbird in Ohio, um, <laughs> one that nests here anyway. There's, there's, I was reading up on it because I know I've heard people saying, oh, we have Anna's hummingbirds. And I'm like, <laughs> not really, just really like <laughs> anecdotally here and there, someone will see one. But really, if you're seeing a hummingbird, probably the ruby-throated hummingbird. So um, this is a picture of the male here. Um, really easy to tell, male versus female, because of the ruby throat. So um, the males tend to be flashier in the <laughs> bird uh, world. So they have a green iridescent back, um, kind of like this buff colored chest, and then that bright ruby throat. Whereas the female, you can see the picture on the right-hand side in the middle there, um, doesn't have the ruby throat. Um, more white going down and then kind of a more dull color and that's um to blend into her surroundings when she's sitting on her nest which their nests are really really cool i have never seen i haven't seen an active one um i've only seen them after the fact but their nests are made of spider silk which is really cool so that the babies um as they grow the nest will expand around it and then they uh, cover the outside with lichens to blend in. They're really, really cool. If you've never seen one before, definitely look up pictures. Um, they don't they don't really make a whole lot of vocalizations. They do. They don't sing, but usually what you hear is their wing beats. Their wings beat super, super fast, and you hear that vibrating sound. And um, I think I haven't. I don't think I've seen one yet. Uh, I was talking to somebody um, in the office and I saw um, a silhouette of what it looked <laughs> like, possibly a hummingbird, but then it flew away so fast I couldn't get a good look at it. But um, they are back. I have seen reports. Have either of you seen one yet? Yes. I saw one on Monday. You have? Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to check tonight or tomorrow. Um, but what else can I say about them? Um, if you want to attract them, a lot of people have hummingbird feeders. I actually happen to have a hummingbird feeder in my office, which was really <laughs> convenient for this. But um, if you want to feed hummingbirds, um, usually they say after the first frost um, is a good time, or after the last frost is a good time to put your hummingbird feeder out. Um, and then I really, really suggest that you make your own hummingbird nectar for your feeders. Um, if you do buy the store-bought, um, just make sure it doesn't have the red dyes in it. Um, they're pretty, they don't know 100% whether it's good for them or bad for them, but it's easier to err on the side of caution. And you can make your own with just um, sugar. Sugar and water is all you need. So, um, and if you are planning to feed them, make sure you keep your feeders clean because um, the sugar gets stale and they don't like it as much. Keep them full because hummingbirds need uh, a lot of food. They're always feeding. Um, I have a friend who's a wildlife rehabilitator and they said when they rehab baby hummingbirds, they have to feed them every 10 minutes. They're Aww. really difficult birds to rehabilitate when they need that. So um, it's, it'd be kind of sad for them to come to an empty feeder. So make sure you're paying attention to that. And then uh, make sure it's not broken or anywhere that they could get caught because they have teeny tiny little feet that could get caught. So just always monitor your feeders. Um, so yeah, sugar water is another good or a good way to um, attract them. And another way is by native plants too. Um, cardinal flower is a great native plant. It's really beautiful. It's bright red. They love the color red. Um, and then wild columbine is another one that's really great for hummingbirds. 
Um, it looks beautiful in your yard too. But that's a talk for another day. We'll do native plants someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put a little plug in for smooth penstemon, which is going to oh, okay. get ready to, uh, to, to flower here um, soon. And my I get lots of visits to uh, to that, as well as wild bergamot and bee balm. They, they, they spend a lot of time there. I'm so glad you chose this one because last year we had the, the little gift of having a nest in the tree um, at the edge of our, our uh, property. And it was so fun to oh. watch all the activity yeah and they those little nests that they can they fit all their little eggs into a nest about the size of a quarter so imagine that yeah, oh, yeah so their, easy. their eggs are about like the size of a tic tac they're so tiny oh. um they're but, a yeah. bird too and the males if you get two males or you know or two two birds around a feeder they can get pretty feisty with each other <laughs> it's cute. um they can oh, also true. get pretty close to you as well. I remember um, at a nature center I used to work at, I would change the hummingbird feeders and they're pretty brazen. I mean, you can be holding it and they will be feeding out of it as you're holding them. Oh, wow. like, Come on lady, let's go, hurry it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've also seen, um, if you wanna go down a YouTube rabbit hole, just uh, look up people feed it, hand feeding hummingbirds too. Um, pretty much the closest thing to being a Disney princess, I think. <laughs> yeah, people people come up with some ingenious ways to do that. But um, yeah, I have uh, one not thing seen I was, one yet. Sorry. One thing I wanted to say with the hummingbird is that you do one part water, I'm sorry, one part sugar, uh, four parts water. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just so you don't, because it's if anything's too strong, I guess it's not good for their kidneys. Yeah. Uh, intense sugar there, so that's it. <laughs> good, yeah, good. All right. Excellent. And then our next last bird, but not least. Yeah. Also, I, I must like a red chest. <laughs> I, I didn't even realize I put them together when I <laughs> um so this is the rose breasted gross beak. And uh this is the male in the picture, and the female and the male look almost nothing alike. Mm -hmm. Um the female usually throws me for a loop the first time I see one during a season. My brain has to relearn. I'm like what kind of sparrow is that? And I'm like, that's no sparrow. <laughs> that giant beak. <laughs> that gives it away. Yep. From a distance, you're like, who is that? Um, almost kind of looks like a female red-winged blackbird too, the similar coloring. But um, yeah, the beak gives it away. So the the name, it's all in the name. Uh, so the rose-breasted obviously comes from the rose breast. And then gross kind of means like big or fat. So it's kind of got a fat beak. And um, similar body shape and beak shape to the cardinal that we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. If you put mm -hmm. them side by side, you can see uh, the similarities and they're in the same family. So that makes sense. Um, and they use their beaks to crack open seeds. So um, if you're looking to feed rose-breasted gross beaks, you want them in your yard. Um, black oil sunflower is a good one for them. Um, and I read that they really like hopper feeders and like platform feeders because that's how they feed. Um, they live in like forests and forest edges. So they're used to hanging out in shrubs. So they like a place to sit while they eat, as do I. I understand that. <laughs> so um, they, they want to be comfortable. So give them a nice platform feeder. Um, what else? Can you want to listen to the call for this one? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Play the little call again. I love that sound. <laughs> Excellent. And if, just as a little note for those of you visiting some of our Portage Park District properties, we did have a nesting pair of these um, at Morgan Park right along the edge of the woods as you transition from the meadow trail to um, the woodland loop. You, they were they were right there on the northern side, and uh, it was really neat to watch. Yeah, and if I didn't mention it before, both the hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird, and the rose-breasted grosbeak are migratory too. So they're just now arriving within the last few weeks here, and then they'll leave again in the fall. So see them now while you can. Yeah, yeah I've actually noticed that a lot of the uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks are eating my safflower uh, seed. I have just a single uh, safflower feeder 
well, I mean, that's one of my heaters, but I, they seem to like the safflower seed. Okay. So it's, it's an option there. Yes. Nice. And then um, if you're looking to attract, you know, any birds, if you're maybe just setting up your feeders for the first time, I just like to think about their basic needs, you know, food, water, shelter, habitat. Um, your habitat is kind of based on where you live. You can, not a lot you can do to control that, but planting native plants um, is definitely a great way to attract them. Um, providing a variety of foods um, for them to eat, uh, seeds, suet, um, if you're looking to attract bluebirds, even mealworms, I have never done that personally. Um, but I've heard great success with it. Um, and then as Leanne mentioned before, um, Orioles love grape jelly and oranges. Um, yeah, providing fruits is another way to, um, that's something you'd have to monitor though, make sure they don't go bad or anything like that. Um, it's really how much time you want to devote to your bird feeders. Um, but the more time you put into it, the more birds you're gonna see. So, time and money. <laughs> Right. Um, providing um, planting shrubs and things for them to land in. Hummingbirds, um, you want to make sure they have a place to land too because they're always flying and sometimes they need to rest. So just being mindful of those things. If you really want to get fancy, put in a bird bath, put in a heated bird bath to extend that season a little bit. There's all kinds of things you can do. Excellent. Um, I wanted to ask a question too, and I, I did not ask this. I just thought of it, so I didn't ask you ahead of time, Cassie. <laughs> but I've been seeing a lot of folks talking about um, uh, suet feeders and you know how to um, like having trouble with starlings that they're you know getting on the suet feeders. Uh, any tips on that? Have you ever? I have never used the upside down ones, but I hear that those might work a little better to mm -hmm. uh, starlings. Yeah, I haven't either. Um... <laughs> I am kind of a defeatist when it comes to starlings. Um, <laughs> I just kind of accept them as they are. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have any good starling deterrent tips. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, they the starlings and the grackles will definitely go at the, the uh, suet. I, I put out uh, typically two at a time and the, it'll be gone and the suet cakes will be gone in eh, about 36 hours. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, yeah. I, I do a homemade one that I have a recipe that I make, but it's just, you know, I guess they're all God's creatures, you know? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I always say when you're putting up a bird feeder, you're putting up an everything feeder because the, you know, the seed feeds the birds, but then the hawks eat the birds and then it also feeds the mice, which attracts the snakes. So you're really inviting all wildlife. Um, it's kind of hard to discriminate which wildlife comes to your yard, but right, raccoons, <laughs> raccoons, <laughs> squirrels, chipmunks. Yep. Yeah, I did want to just say one quick thing to the folks listening about um, about feeding birds. I mean, I personally, so I have a lot of native plants and trees that are planted in my yard, but um, I stopped feeding birds a number of years ago um, because we have a lot of um, indoor outdoor cats in my neighborhood and. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, cats are a major predator of songbirds and it doesn't matter if you're feeding your cat um, because it's not about hunger um, it's just their instinct to hunt and so both if you are a cat owner <laughs> one thing you can do to help the birds is to keep the cat safe inside it'll extend its life and um, the life of the birds and if you are um, if you enjoy birds and you feed, just be conscientious about who's lurking around your feeders. Um, so, you know, if you have it over a bush, um, it's a really nice hiding place. I, the problem I ran into is they were hiding underneath my deck and, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was like a feeding ground. <laughs> so um, just be aware of that. There's plenty of research that's out there to, uh, you know, to just kind of shed some light on that. But I just wanted to give a little word of caution. You can still enjoy a lot of birds in your yard, even if you don't have a feeder set up. Um, I have, in fact, I watched this beautiful a male rose-breasted grosbeak up in the tree just yesterday afternoon. So um, they're, they're definitely around and they'll visit, um, but just be aware of that because that's a big, can be a big problem. Good point. Yeah, my dog tends to chase the cats away. We had we do have a mm. fenced yard, so that does help. Although yeah. you know, cats still can get in through fences, but I don't have the big problem with that with my dog because he's quite aware of 
things like that. So that's nice. Yeah, that is. And he doesn't bother the birds, but yeah. Yeah. I do have a friend that puts her cat on a leash. So that's also an option if your cat is willing. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. So do you guys have any other good finds that you want to share before we wrap up today? Sure. Uh, I saw a, um, a scarlet tanager for the first time this season two days ago in the Towner's Woods. That was exciting. Um, we actually have a, also we have a, um, a homemade, or a, or sorry, a man-made pond. It's a, we have an upper pond with a little creek that goes down to a little larger pond. And I actually, we saw a, um, a palm warbler last night at the creek. And I have never seen a warbler in the yard before because we don't typically, you know, they don't come to the feeders, obviously. Yeah. But I was just like, oh my gosh, it's a palm warbler. Like I see his little pump against tail. Um, so that was neat. So yeah, we've just seen a lot of neat birds this year. But I think that's about it as far as new finds. Um, American Red Star, I think I mentioned that last week. But yeah, I can't think of anything with me. I saw my, par- my palm warbler at my park again. It's mm-hmm. still there. Um, the wood thrushes are still there. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to think. Um, my common yellow throat again um not really a lot of new stuff but a lot of the same stuff I did come upon um I don't I don't remember if I mentioned it last time I was on with you guys but I saw more yellow rumped warblers in one place than I've ever seen in my entire life combined it was I've never seen so many I I mean everywhere I looked every bird was a yellow rumped warbler (laughs) I felt honored to be in their presence I was just (laughs) so great probably 40 of them I think wow. but yeah there's there a lot of yellow rope warblers this year it was very cool very cool sight yeah it's good stuff good stuff well the warblers are still out they're still coming through I still haven't seen my magnolia warbler yet but I know they're around because everybody else has been seeing them I just haven't spotted one yet um but there's uh they're they're definitely still come moving through so if you have if you haven't had a chance um those of you listening to get out and um take a look at uh, the warblers get out there and all some of in fact, a lot of the birds that we talked about today have just started coming through in the past week or two. And so they're, um, they'll be hanging around and some of them will be hanging around all summer, but uh, some are just moving through. So, um, well, thank you ladies for joining and sharing today. And thanks everybody for, for listening and have a great rest of the, bleh, great rest of the week. <laughs> we may have some now. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, Bye. everybody.